Chilhan. Gracious ladies and gentlemen, formed by the Spirit of God, ye call me the Maha Chohan, but I am the representative of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is more than a name. It is a radiation of the Holy Spirit of God. It is the manifestation of great potential for all. It is the radiant connection between each part of the body of God. It carries then from the fire of the individual heart the feelings and a flottus of tenderness and awareness from the individual monad back to the very heart of God. And thence also there is the overflow of the great oversoul of God into the vessels of individuality. How beautiful are the concepts of the Holy Spirit. As Paul the Apostle said, For though there be gods many and lords many, to us there is but one God. And so, ladies and gentlemen, there is but one great spirit emanating from one great heart. But this great spirit, the Holy Spirit, infuses the hearts of all who will accept him. And thus are all united and drink into that one spirit of consecration, which is a tangible radiance as though one were crowned with a crown of light. Light is not darkness. Light instills the dew of compassion upon hearts. Light unites. Light is the guide of all, assuring each individual outpost of God reality, contact and connection with the virtue and presence of that spirit wherever the individual happens to be, focalizing in space the consecrated divine energies that unite and do not divide. The world today is imperiled by many activities of darkness, but these are not the actions of the Holy Spirit. Ask yourselves this question, what is acting in your world? Are you then guided by darkness from the dark stars, of the black magicians, those who have taken the left-handed path? Or are you in sweet and gentle attunement with the fires of God's heart? Oh yes, some of you have heard my words before. You have felt the sternness of my vibration as though I had no room in my heart for you as though I would exclude you. Such is not the case. I choose to exclude all things that are not of God. Therefore, this feeling that some have is simply brought about because they have not yet cast themselves upon the rock, the bedrock of their identity. And thus they feel some compunctions about understanding what I am speaking about or affinitizing with the vibratory action of that Holy Spirit. 
as though the Holy Spirit were too holy for them, as though they could not find room within their consciousness for such a blast of cosmic purity. Well, beloved hearts, it is only this solemn energy that in reality is a radiant cup of cosmic joy that lifts all into that domain where they can joyfully cast out of their consciousness all that is not of the light. Mankind, unfortunately, play host to many parasites which manipulate their consciousness and from time to time send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie and be damned. May I say out of the consecrated cup of cosmic truth that the joy of the Lord is the strength of the morning, that the rays of his appearance dissipate all that is lingering elements of darkness within mankind and within each chosen vessel. Oh, what woes come to those who allow themselves and their standards to fall. For in that fall there is the debacle of the rock falling upon the individual that he may be ground to powder. This is not the will of God, save it is the only way in which the powder can once again be reused and through the granulation of the elements of that individual which originally belonged to God and were all God, that one, even after the second death, may be restored, albeit not with memory or consciousness, back to those elements of life which constitute a resurrection of a shower of God's mercy upon the universe. All compassion is in God. All compassion is in the Holy Spirit. Yet what folly it would be indeed for God to condone the misery of mankind's returning karma and his inevitable destruction if he continually pursues darkness rather than light. Therefore I say to you tonight, and I am speaking from that part of the world where it is night, and I say to you tonight that the light of God and the light of ten thousand suns shines then throughout the world's whole consciousness but the world does not perceive it. And therefore now that I am bringing to you a greater understanding of the measures of the Holy Spirit, be not involved in those simplistic concepts that actually will tear you down, but rather into those exalted concepts that will lift you up it requires a concentration of mankind's energy, the energies of the heart and the fires of the heart, to summon and draw together rather than to push aside carelessly, to reject truth simply because it does not seem at first to be compatible with your own understanding. Well, beloved ones, as time moves on and the veil is lifted, you will be able to see more and more that many conditions that appear at first to be black are really white. And I say to you truly, many conditions that appear to be white are the blackest of conditions. Oh, be warned, beloved mankind, of the great dangers inherent in criticisms and judgments, in darkness, and Satanism. Truly, the lifting, elevating, ennobling power of God is to be found in the Holy Spirit. 
and those who search with all their heart to affinitize themselves with God will recognize and understand that out of the consciousness of God will be born newness of life. The fragmentations mankind have endured and suffered are truly the result of their own karmic doings. They are the result of the darkness that is being spread abroad in the world and the manipulative faculties of humanity which enable them to viciously control individuals. Will you understand then that as the spirit is able to control the functioning of your world, it will lead you into all truth and will depart you from all darkness? Carry on then in that magnificent activity of seeking to truly be filled with the light of the Holy Spirit and the love of God that unites hearts, that sends out into the world a feeling of buoyancy, a feeling of joy, a feeling of compassion for mankind, but is aware of the great need that in some cases they suffer those chastisements of God and of the Holy Spirit that are the righteous return by the power of the great law of that which they have sent out into the world. And all mankind who would be wise, tether yourself to those virtuous manifestations of the Holy Spirit that lead and guide you into all truth. Tether yourself to the action of true divine love that reaches out not to condemn but to heal and be pillars of virtue in the temple of your God. Do not fear to dwell in the tents of righteousness for truly only the tents of righteousness are the goodly tents of God which stand in the desert of life until an oasis of cosmic law, the kingdom of heaven can at last manifest among all hearts because all hearts are in consonance with the word of concord, the temple of life, the beauty and perfection of the great law, the manifestation of the spirit most holy, amplifying in your life all that is of that great law, and restoring to you the days of your God victory when first you came forth upon the lap of God and were then cast as a burning and shining lamp into the world to let your light shine. But the light grew dim and darkness enclosed it round about the darkness of the world that is enmity with God. And then at last you came once again to see the filaments of joy in the sky shining as aurora borealis, as a light in the darkness. And as you reached up and touched it with the fingers of the Spirit, you were able to perceive at last that it was the intent of heaven that you should know no distress ultimately, but have every tear wiped away from your eyes and enter in to that consecrated joy of divine mercy that everywhere speaks of the Spirit of God and the building of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is builded by the action of the whirlwind Holy Spirit as it functions to summon lives out of the nets and pits of darkness into the realm of consecration and love where God is able to firmly reestablish upon earth His will even as it is in heaven. In the name of the Holy Spirit, I salute you. In the name of the universal Christ consciousness, I salute you. In the name of the spark of vibrant joy that is your soul within, I salute you. One and all.
John long ago declared that he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. So today, the Holy Spirit manifests in the world order, responding to hearts, responding to calls that are made by myriad individuals, crying out, how long, O oh Lord, let mankind understand that as I spake long ago, saying, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. So then, before your eyes, before your manifest gaze, the temples of the flowers are before you. The lilies of the field, the roses, and many beautiful expressions that comprise a temple builded without hands, fashioned by divine design. Inherent then within nature are those magnificent designs of natural unfoldment. These manifestations are before your gaze. And as you behold them, try to feel the delicate weaving of the patterns of life that are within them and consider how as they manifest beauty and purity of expression, so you individually can unfold your own latent divinity until that divinity becomes a central purpose of your life manifestation. When men and women understand what it means to weave a garment of the Spirit they cannot possibly engage wholeheartedly in that activity. This is why we urge upon you all a release in your feeling world and your thinking world from all that is the former things that ought to pass away and the renewing of your Christ mind in that wholesome manifestation of God relativity, whereby you relate the force field of your life unto Him and understand that the waves of cosmic energy which He sends into your world in response to your calls is indeed a timeless, infinite manifestation of the Father unto the Son for each of you holding near and dear to the folds and all enfolding love of your holy Christ self are able to put on those vestments of the Spirit, those vestments of God, which will make you God-like and return and restore to you that mighty privilege of life which is to be in the Father's image, 24 hours out of the day and each day in that ongoing consummate flame of spiritual reality which will strip from your mind and your feeling world those thoughts that are opposed to the light rather than cultivating a manifestation of that light. O oh, hearts of light, will you respond now to my love, which is an all-enfolding love, reaching out into the world to produce those constructive changes in the consciousness of mankind and mass that will ready them and prepare them for that acceptance of my spirit and the spirit of the eternal love of God 
in which they all ought to dwell. Mankind today are heading down the broad road that leadeth to their destruction. For truly in the world mind today, all that has been set forth by them has been the measure of demoniac destruction of the forces that divide, of the forces that seek to divide, both in government, in politics, in religion, and within the heart of man. Will you then come apart from the world and be a separate people chosen unto the beauty of holiness and the love of God that when spread abroad upon the earth can become a mantle, a fiery mantle to release the world from those forces that ever draw mankind downward into that impelling light of resurrection, the resurgence of those glories that are transmutative and will produce the fruit of the eternal promise without fail. I come into the world domain then to produce change in mankind, constructive change that spans the ages and every other member, every other master of the great white brotherhood holds forth that same pristine light, that self-same purity of purpose that ushers in the beauty of the golden age to come. Will you see then and behold that the golden age is one tinged by the glorious mind of God? Let all see and perceive that the glorious mind of God is the mind of creative effort whereby the world was framed by the word in the beginning, part standing in the water and part standing out of the water. Let man understand then the glorious balance of perfection that can be the lot of every man, freeing all from destructive images and releasing into the world order those constructive images of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that will make all truly free. Unless man become free, they cannot enter in to the kingdom of God, for this is indeed the kingdom of the freeborn. Ye were born free. Will you live free? Ye were born free. Will you accept the mantle of your freedom without fail and let that power radiate out into the world even to those who are ignorant of the great Christ mission which I gave unto the world, even unto those who do not understand the fruit of my mission to the ages. Let all understand then that timeless love that in ages to come shall give to every man, woman, and child an open sesame into a future realm of infinite awareness and true Christ peace. The efforts of the great ones as they extend themselves over the world domain will produce a kingdom of heaven upon this earth that shall indeed be worthy of the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God. In building this kingdom of heaven among mankind, will you understand that you all indeed are lively stones that comprise a temple that shall hallow the incoming spirit of life and that portent of cosmic beauty that is to be? Why is it to be? Because your readiness demonstrated in some degree shall become complete as you accept it. Do you see? God has never withheld from mankind any good thing, but has prepared good things without 
number to give to all mankind. His spirit is a spirit that does not blunder. His is a spirit that is not blind. Will you awake then out of the sleeping that seizes the minds of unwary men and by the conscious awareness of his beauty and love teach unto all men and proclaim the incoming of the kingdom brought forth in my name. O oh, beloved ones, do you understand the power of a name? Do you understand what is embodied in it? It is all God, all glory, all joy, all peace, all righteousness. There is no room in the heavenly inn for the smoot and the darkness of the world. But the world did not have room either for me in the inn of their consciousness. They thrust me into a stable where the glory of the angels shone round about and the glory of the Lord encompassed the wonders of my message that was to be. But it rings clear now two thousand years hence and reveals to all in my Father's name that out of the unity of our oneness and out of the unity of each man's oneness may we proclaim the unity of all hearts. Truly light shall prevail. Truly life shall burst forth. Truly the temples of the flowers, of the grasses, of all of nature shall be revealed for what it is, a temple of the Spirit. Truly your bodies shall become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Truly life shall become that which has been envisioned for ages. What you have called, some men have called, the apocalyptic vision shall be a breathing, living reality as you accept it and become free, as mankind accepts it and becomes free. For only human consciousness and human thoughts have characterized the manifestation of their own limitations. Now as more and more individuals begin to see the fruit of the Spirit as a potential now, Shall we bring in the kingdom of heaven upon earth? And hatred and darkness and distress shall be no more. For our love shall enfold all, even as it already does. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel unto you to testify. Yea, these things are true.
flame within the soul rise and pulsate. To be or not to be posed as a question brings mankind a challenge which we shall see as to whether or not they can solve. They have been given the snow from the mountain as the mellow water of life. They have been given the purifying fires and they have asked for and received our assistance since time immemorial. Now let us find out of what substance men and women are made of. Those of you who understand truth are aware that mankind is made first of all of the God flame, which state is unalterable. But when we speak of the material of which a man or a woman is composed, we speak of those graces which they themselves have externalized and consider graces of worth. Graces of worth that will stand the test of time. It is one thing to invoke the flame of the Godhead and let that flame blaze. It is still something else when man becomes self-dependent, to stand upon his own two feet and to recognize his own responsibility. This is a portion of the gift of life. For when men have the gift of life, they are expected to use it. This is the gaining of other talents, of other facets of wisdom of other strengths, of other joys, of other magnificence than that which they have deemed magnificent. For there are hidden reservoirs of divine strength in the universe which are available to all, simply because men do not know how to tap these magnificent sources of strength is no excuse or had they listened, had they removed from their ears the wax and those conditions which we consider stultifying, they would long ago have recognized their solemn responsibility and not have become so brittle and so utterly dependent upon us. Perhaps it may sound to you as though all the hosts of heaven are actually arrayed on your side and standing with you. Quite so. But let me point out another factor. And that is that we love the children of the light who stand upon their own two feet and resolve their own problems and then come to us when they are unable to act for succor, for assistance for a glimpse, a further glimpse of reality. Tempest fugit. Time flies indeed, but where are those who will make good use of it? Where are those who will summon the will to respond when the requirement is given? Let us hear from them as they have sought to hear from us. For man also has many stakes to gain, many stakes that amount to stars in the crown of his own individual being. And when I gaze upon the record, when I perceive all that man can do if he summons the will to do it, I am determined that more individuals upon the planetary body shall rise subject 
to their own steam and electrical power. For those who do so are the strong ones, the magnificent ones, the ones who have seen the face of God and lived as he directed them. Those of us who have gazed upon the magnificence of the appearance of the Christ are well aware of what man can do when he determines to align himself with the fervor of the sacred fire. The sacred fire. Well, if you consider it sacred, O mankind, as I do also, then it is just about time that you will depend upon it for many things and not just for a few things. Wit is given to man to be used. Courage is given to man to be used. And a multitude of gifts. When men understand that they have these gifts, do they expect to cast them aside as useless baggage? How many graces are resident within human souls? And where did they secure these graces? The mere fact that they are in their possession should be ample. For responsibility is a gift. And that gift is ennobled through use and the sharpening of individual mankind's wits. In coping with the enemy and putting the powers of darkness in their place, in the name of heaven, beloved mankind, do you think simply because you are fatigued from day to day over things of the world that you cannot arise and give your energy to the light when the light requires it for a planet, for mankind, for others? I am certain that you can. We did. When we were embodied upon earth, many times we were empty of any possibility of assistance. Yet we drew upon our resources. We were able to summon them by an act of will. We initiated courage and carried it forth. We have insisted upon this in many of the students. Now I watch them as they walk tall and stand straight. I watch them as they draw forth for themselves those cosmic actions that feed the universal fires. They are not, as it were, dependent upon any of us, for they have created their own fires and strength and they offer to us their energy. The student body throughout the world have long depended upon our assistance, which we have been most willing to give. We have been chastened of late by the great karmic lords ourselves. For the great karmic lords have said, is this display of your strength in any way conducive to the betterment of humanity. Are humanity raised by it? Or do they merely use your energy and dissipate it on senseless pursuits upon their own lusts and upon their own confusions? The answer is yet not clear. In some cases, I am certain that individuals subscribe to our banners without actually raising them. It is very easy for mankind to express a desire to cultivate goodness upon earth. In some ways, it almost resembles Androcles and the lion taken from Shaw. But humanity failed so often to understand 
that support given from higher octaves is not without anticipated compensation. For years now, for decades, I might say, in many cases, the masters for centuries have given their energy to embodied mankind only to find that mankind have literally spilled it upon the ground. They have discoursed with one another in inharmony. They have argued concerning the most sacred truths. And they seem utterly unwilling to harmonize themselves for a purpose. Let us summon mankind then, I said to the karmic board, and let our summoning be one memorable experience. Too long have we coddled them. Too long have we blessed them with our energy without creating in them some great cosmic fervor that will blaze to the farthest star. It is time, mankind, that you recognize the tremendous power that you have received already in the simplest manifestations of life. The summoning of these powers, the summoning of your own powers, when put together totals quite a sum. Indeed, I am astounded sometimes to see the idle motors of life and the number of people throughout the world who stand behind the idea of constructivism. Oh yes, they would support every movement in heart, or so they say. But when it comes to the practical aspects of standing behind the movements of light, they seem to gingerly turn the other cheek, as it were, to heaven and look the other way right at the supreme moment when they are needed most. What shall I say then? Shall I commend them still further and say, we approve of what you do? Not so. The time has come throughout the world when we ought to make mankind aware of the tremendous disparagement that they create when they continue to feed the negative assets of the world and deny to the great positive powers of light their strength in the support of those cosmic endeavors that could change the family of nations into families of light at will. If mankind would only understand that this is the will of heaven and that embodied mankind are the beneficiaries of much of this and yet seem in many cases unwilling to even consider the smallest act that they can perform that will have real meaning in the world because it will create greater awareness in the world of divine principle. O oh, mankind, what shall I say as I gaze upon the record? When I pause to see the tremendous investment of cosmic energy which heaven itself has made in life, and then I see the very little investment of cosmic energy coming forth in return, and then I pause to consider that after all, the only reason heaven expects any return at all is so that mankind may be further benefited. Is this clear to you? I hope that it is. For the chinks in the human armor are many. And the dust that blows through these chinks carries pollution into inner realms and men stand midst dusty confusion when in reality they could behold the icons of the Christ upon the wall of consciousness just as easily as they could behold and do behold the gremlins of negativity and the words it cannot be done. Why can it not be done? Simply because men and women are too lazy to summon the will to do it. This is why it is not being done. They have energy for everything else, but very little for those spiritual achievements that will enable the brothers to raise mankind. 
In the name of heaven, beloved ones, what do you think happens when mankind who have free will deny that free will to heaven? Why, you cut off the entire stream of benefits to the earth by the mere refusal to do sometimes the simplest act that would have initiated a grand cycle in the cosmic scheme. And I have seen this over the years, and it has utterly collapsed some of the best plans which heaven has laid for mankind and made so carefully before it released it in the first place. How do you suppose Lord Maitreya feels? How do you suppose Lord Gautama feels? How do you suppose your beloved Jesus feels who has again and again sponsored embodied humanity? When he beholds, as does Kathumi, the world looking the other way, right when the hands of heaven are reaching out to bestow the greatest benefit. What more shall I say? Shall I say nothing? Nay, this I cannot do. For unless mankind become chastised by our love, they may well develop that complacency which will utterly put them to sleep. The sleep of man's reason, the sleep of man's strength, the sleep of man's benefits, for all is lost unless this generation is able to perceive the missing link between their God self and their human self. I do not expect actually that the entire earth will accept this, that the entire earth will see it. But I do expect that some of you who have over the years developed a more than ordinary devotion toward our consciousness will understand at last that it is not a matter of our appreciation or our failure to appreciate what you have done, but it is a matter of summoning greater energy to meet the tremendous gap in human consciousness and human achievement. Human achievement, while it may be great from the term of skyrockets and skyscrapers, is very low from the standpoint of true spirituality. Will you face this with your whole consciousness of cosmic fairness? Will you dare to tell me tonight that embodied humanity have laid upon the cosmic scales a balance worthy of mention. I do not think so, and I do not anticipate that some of you will call me beloved. You may say, as some have said, the gruff old Master Moria has spoken again, and we hope he won't speak for a long time again. This does not matter to me, for I am concerned with those babes and souls and those blessed people throughout the world who need and require the aid and succor that you and the brethren of light the world around can give. Only by a steadfast, clean, burning flame are we able to actually produce that purification in the body of mankind's consciousness which the hour demands. You hear about the foolish virgins. Well, beloved mankind, must men continue generation after generation to create the same mistakes? I hope not. And so, as I come to address you this night, it is to leave stirring in your memories those concepts that will stir you to the uttermost to do and to be a focus of the will of God. For only a genuine focus of the will of God can transform the world. Men love the flame of comfort. They love to be comforted. It is almost as though the memory of the cradle and the arms of the mother are so loved 
and the arms of maturity so despised because they mean that man must sharpen the flame of the mind, that man must sharpen the flame of the will, that man must sharpen the fires of the heart and summon from the heart of God those magnificent and masterful energies which will take command of the world's situation and free mankind at last from all of these insipid actions of humanity which have divorced him from the realities of God and hidden from him the power of the Divine Mother who would give him, if he would accept it, the power to wrought change in his generation, in every way. What do you think your decrees are then? Are they just the mouthing of vain words, that these vain words will go out into the world, or just into the room? Well, if you believe that they will go out into the world and you believe that they are not vain words, in the name of heaven, utter them as though you meant them. For then they will begin to determine effectively that a change ought to be wrought in the world order. And you will see that change manifest before your gaze. Function in this manner and say, Beloved presence of God, please help us and watch how little help you will get, even though the sentiments and the respect may appear to be genuine. For I can say to you that when you step with the foot upon the rocks of life in a gingerly manner, surely you can easily fall off the rocks. But when there is sure-footedness and a determinate response that must evoke newness of life in the multitudes, then, beloved hearts of life, the great summoning has brought the great response. And none of us mind giving our energy. None of us mind giving our counsel. None of us mind giving our benediction. None of us mind anything that we can do to further mankind in their development. Awake thou that sleepest is the cry. Did not the Christ also rebuke his disciples because they slept? This quality of mankind's sleepiness has spanned the millenniums. If it has spanned the millenniums, don't you think it is quite an unhealthy momentum? Well, let's do something about it then. Let's determine now that each of you shall make his own God pledge and keep it, that nothing shall stand in the way of manifesting the acceptance of the mantle of opportunity. What do you suppose that opportunity is all about? Do you think that opportunity means that perhaps, maybe, yes, if this condition will take place, then that condition will follow. And so you set up a pattern of conditions and you begin, in effect, to dictate to the deity. You say to the deity, I will do this if you will do this. And this bargaining with God is not an effective means of calling forth that which he is already so willing to give. Humanity today are more interested in games than they are in the serious game of life. When souls are at stake and humanity's future stands before them as either full or bleak, what do you suppose they take? They choose bleakness and cast fullness to the winds. Man's error has existed far too long. It is time that the resolve be strengthened. People like straight spines in others. How do they like it in themselves? We shall see. We shall see who shall respond to my call. Who shall respond to the call from Darjeeling? We shall see who will say, Moria, we love you. 
and then turn around and do everything upside down. We shall see. We shall see. And you shall see also. For if perchance, through the power of divine faith, you can recognize the need to cut yourselves free, I think the change that you will see then will be so magnificent, so beautiful, so filled with the wings of life and light that the manifestation will surprise even the most advanced of you. Wouldn't it be nice for a change to surprise heaven? Let's do it. Let's have, in effect, beloved children of the light, a surprise party on heaven. Let's see if the record of preceding generations can be wiped out a bit simply because embodied mankind determined that it shall be so. You would be quite surprised yourselves if you knew the tremendous amount of will and resolve concentrated in this room in which I am speaking. Yes, but having will, possessing it, and using it are two different things. Let us try. Let us try. Let us try. It may work even better than praying. I thank you. Proceed. The measure of his love cannot be calculated by human value, for his presence was one of sweetness, simplicity, and eternal mastery. His presence was one of intimate attunement both with God and man. Behold what manner of man he was and see yourself as you will be when the heavenly virtues and plan are unfolded in thee. O immeasurable love, O oh, eternal esteem, how magnificent are those concepts that embody the thought of a brotherhood beyond the skies that equates itself so beautifully, so bountifully with the present practical world of manifestation. Whenever we were with the Master, it was always with the abiding sense of his consciousness 
outreaching beyond the stars, but never so far away that we did not feel in our heart that bond between his heart and ours, which spoke of a cup of compassion to come, a love to unfold, a virtue to understand based upon a law that we could recognize even through those homely virtues which he so often discoursed about. You may call me John, it matters not. For above all things I wish to be remembered for my closeness in spirit unto Jesus, unto the sense of reality and love which he embodied, and unto the visions that he released into our minds. It is scarcely possible for embodied mankind in the world of human density and human struggle in which mankind is engaged today to really understand the measure of that solemn moment, to really understand the measure of each blessed moment with the Master, to understand his sense of delight with the blessed whole capsule of life. We never found anything in the world of nature that did not itself become involved with his mind, whether it was a field of wheat or a billowing sky, whether or not it was a small child that cried or whether it was a distraught servant who felt alone and bereft of friends in the world. Everywhere he went, he was involved with people. He was involved with hearts. Some he rebuked. Some he even chastised. Yet to others, he spoke as an intimate brother, as one who was a part of the same family. It was not always possible to predict what form of conduct he would take for a given moment, for his heart was so pliable, so perfect in its thought, in its outreach, in its awareness. There were times when in our own thoughts, quietly, when first we knew him, we sometimes fancied him to be like other men and to be imbued with human motives. And then other moments came when we knew that all that he did was indeed fashioned after heavenly patterns. We knew then that there was a purpose in each act which he performed. I remember well when he foretold his own passing from the screen of life. Momentarily we were numbed with a sense of fear, frustration, and imminent loss. The world today can scarcely know the meaning of this, can scarcely understand, for they are involved in most cases in the chaos of the world and a sense of a far-off master. We are speaking of one who seemed our very heart itself. And so when he foretold his crucifixion, the difficult situation in which he would live within a matter of hours or days. 
our hearts were cast down, almost destroyed. We could not believe that these things would happen to one who was truly so close to God, truly so capable of identification with nature and mastery of nature. The days pass swiftly and suddenly after his passing and all things were fulfilled exactly as he predicted. This vision gave us tremendous confidence an awareness as we said amongst ourselves, behold, the Master knoweth all things. And it was so. But today mankind, having had their faith sorely tried in many ways, witnessing the weight of human discord, jangle and confusion, do not really have the experiences that we had because life appears to be different unto them. But, O oh, beloved mankind, I want to tell you that life is not really different now, nor has life ever been different. It has frequently been difficult because mankind, through the great veil, through the great miasma of human concepts, has not beheld the shining face of God reality. The bounties of the blue skies have been taken so for granted. The bounties of the bread of life waving in the fields as mellow golden grain have been taken so for granted. Men do not really understand the nature of the universe. They are often filled with what appears to them to be a form of reality. And they are satisfied with such a small portion of life. I come then this day to speak to you of the magnificent example set by the Master and to point out to all that the master of love was also a master of power, a master of faith and stern reality that could face each moment with a certain sense of knowing that all would be well ultimately. If mankind today will only accept the certitude of God's love so bountifully praised and raised in the Christ, they will be able also to possess the same balance of spirit that he possessed. For did he not say of old, the things that I do shall ye do, and greater things shall ye do, for I go unto my Father? Let your hearts be lifted up to the cup of love today. And as I speak to you, let it be received with a concept within yourself of immortal love, of immortal life, of immortal hope. Let it be a flame within yourself that speaks of intimate immortality and immortality that is your own, an immortality that is all men's. But each man must for himself make that reality of God a breathing, magnificent manifestation. It is not enough for embodied mankind to merely speculate on God's reality they must wear it as a kimono or a shawl, as a mantle or even a mantle flame. They must renew the covenant of their love with God. 
They must accept both the gentle realities of heaven and those stern realities that rebuke the human soul because through suffering man is sometimes blessed with understanding. If man could learn the great truths of God without suffering, it would appear to be best. But if there is no other way, beloved hearts of life, that love can be taught, save through suffering, then let men learn to bear it well and wisely. For one day, as the Master said, all tears shall be wiped away from the eyes of mankind. And gentle, yet all-powerful love will be an ocean of exquisite sweetness, wafting those blossoms of immortality and cosmic joy between hearts that will make all content with the contentment of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is very near to those who seek with all sincerity for the peace of God. But those who insist on breaking the eternal peace of God with the violence of their own mind, with the vileness of their own thoughts, when they are contrary to God's thoughts, so frequently desecrate the sanctity of man's life and word. It has seemed to the brothers of light that perchance those who are so violent ought to be involved in more violence as life flashes out to exhibit to them what they are creating. But then the compassion, the mercy, and the love of God has exerted itself almost to the realm of boundlessness. But the time has come when the cosmic lords have said, Behold, he that takes the sword shall perish with it. And so when you see in the world signs of dark doings, of evil, of wickedness, of human struggle, try to realize that one day that which is no part of your real self will cease to be everywhere. For the kingdom of heaven is a tangible reality, a reality that man can feel and be a part of even while simultaneously beholding the world with its mimicry of one another, its struggle to know the meaning of love without ever understanding it. Love is not just those satisfactions which men can receive through associations with others. Love is a part of the body of God. It is an appreciation of all that life can and will do for mankind. By the power of love, more things are done in this world that assuage the soul's grief than man can ever know until he is ascended and free. In coming to you this afternoon, it is with the certitude of God's love that will move men because it is all-powerful that will remove from them all that which discourages their hearts and creates patterns of human ideals without ever truly revealing just what God and his love really are. The love of God removes from the world not only this moment but in all moments to come all its darkness, all its struggle, 
all its sense of false value and replaces it all with that God feeling that speaks of cosmic worth. Cosmic worth is eternal worth and it is all yours hidden in the love of God and drawn forth magnetically as you grow in grace and the knowledge of God as you grow in self-mastery as you grow in gentle humility I, John, have spoken of this which remains a part of every human life which remains for some to discover which has touched others with a gentle hand as of the whisper of the divine wind but to others is a myth that vanishes away as a passing cloud of fancy lo the master has said I am with you always. So in memory of his magnificent service, I remain one who abides in his faith, his hope, his charity. Peace be unto you.